Um, so the question was, why are there so many names for the goddess? And I think, I feel, and I've also read in a few places, that um, it makes it easier for us to understand and accept that diversity exists in the universe. And that diversity is not a bad thing. And that if we look at the diversity of the goddess, all her names, all her forms, all her essences, and we can fall in love with that, then we can look from a tantric perspective at this world, at this life, recognize its diversity and fall in love with that too. Not fall in love with that in a way that is attached harmfully, but recognition of the sacred. To recognize that our challenges, the things that come to us easy, the things we really have to work and strive for, the things that we don't really have to try at all, that it's really all the same. It's, it's diverse. And because we have a tendency to grasp psychologically, we want this, we don't want that, so we grasp and we avoid, it causes us a lot of suffering especially when we're grasping at things that we either can't have, it's not time for us to have, or it's time for it to leave and we don't want it to. Or we avoid things that it's time for us to have. Um, but we avoid out of fear. We avoid out of preference. We avoid um, out of egotism. So all this avoiding and grasping really... It is the root of our suffering, according to the Buddha, and I would agree with that completely. So in being able to embrace the different aspects of the goddess as equally sacred, there's no form of the goddess that is beyond any other form. They're all her, so they're all equal. Similarly, every part of life is equal. So don't look at your sorrows and your trials as having less value than your triumphs and your joys. Look at them the same. And then you cultivate equanimity. And equanimity is a quality in yoga that is a very evolved quality. Many of us think we have it. Nope. Not. That would be called fooling yourself. <laughs> it's, 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 it's such an extremely evolved quality to have true equanimity even the Dalai Lama says and he's very open and honest about it he's, you know, somebody asked him he said, well you must be over anger but you don't get angry anymore at all and he was like that makes me angry <laughs> <laughs> that someone should think that of me you know He's, he's saying, you know, of course he reacts to things. He's a human. And in this human form, we are exposed not only to the perfect harmony of the mother, but to the disharmony of the mother as well. She's changeable, flexible, pliable. She yields to everything. And there's three aspects within her, sattva, rajas, and tamas. And these are the three qualities that we see in nature everywhere, and in our mind, in our body, out there, everywhere. Rajas is passion. It's activity. It's movement. It's, it's the inability to stay still. It's the fidget. It's the changing of the leaves at the peak of the change. It's the falling in love. It's the passion that you feel lustfully. It's the joy of motherhood. It's the growth of the child and the discovery that the child is constantly going through. It's also the anger and the hyperimposition of our attitude it's the controlling. 
It's the feeling that we have to win, 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 and that we will go to any extent to do so. That's also rajas. So this rajasic kind of a, of a movement, which is both beautiful and sometimes not so beautiful, <coughs> depending on how it's being applied. And then we have tamas, and tamas, or tamasic nature, is when a leaf falls off the tree, after it's changed into that beautiful color, it's fell off the tree and it goes down to the ground where it rots and dies completely and goes back to the earth as dust. And it contributes to something else. But that process of, of no life force. For us, it's like when we wake up on a rainy morning and we feel super lazy because we had too many pancakes. <laughs> and if you haven't yet, you will. <laughs> you know? That's very tamasic. That's very lethargic. So tamas is the opposite of rajas. Rajas is activity. Tamas is not at all active. It's not all bad, though, because you want a little bit of tamas in your meditation, don't you? You want to be able to stay still. But you don't want so much tamas that you fall asleep. So, and with rajas, you want enough enthusiasm that you're called to go meditate, but you don't want so much enthusiasm that you can't sit still. So in between these two places, in between the tamas and the rajas, is the sattva. And sattva is balance. The sattva is the harmony. The sattva is the perfect condition for things to happen, or not. It's like what the seed needs in order for the seed to sprout. It's the sattvic conditions. Seeds will also sprout under other conditions. But then the life of what comes from the seed will not fulfill its potential. It'll still have potential. And it is a beautiful potential. But it will not have its complete expression. And it will therefore have to repeat karma. Yeah. So these three qualities of nature exist within the goddess. And they're always fluctuating and changing. Just look outside. It's raining harder now. Maybe the sun will come out in five minutes. Maybe not. Maybe. So can we be okay with this? Can we recognize the sacredness in this fluctuation, in this change? And can we recognize it as an expression of the goddess because it embodies the same qualities that the goddess embodies? So the rain is the goddess. The change of seasons, that is the goddess. The storm is the goddess. The calm after the storm is the goddess. The falling in love is the goddess. The falling out of love is the goddess. The experience is the goddess. It's her energy coming forward through Raja Sattva and Tamas within our experience, our body, our mind, our intentions. And so that's why they call it a dance. Because it's a constant back and forth. It's a constant playing. It's a constant... Who here watches that? Um, uh, Dancing with the Stars? Right? Isn't that fun? It's like you never know what the heck they're going to do. And sometimes they come out and they, they don't do real well. Other times they come out and it's awesome. It's like that, you know? It's like how much uh, fun, enjoyment, play are you experiencing in the back and forth? Or are you just hyper-focused on the back or the forth to the point where you are not permitting yourself to enjoy any of it? Mm, big question. Big question. We need to be serious about our spiritual practice. We need to be serious because otherwise we become violent. We need to become serious, but not so serious that we become violent. So we don't want to be tamasic because that will lead us to violence. And we don't want to be so rajasic about our spiritual practice that it leads us to violence but we want to be serious about our spiritual practice such that it leads us to sattva. It leads us to balance. 
And that requires skill, recognition, and clarity. And a certain kind of courage to stand up and not sit back down again. So it requires acknowledgement of Saraswati, Lakshmi, Dorgama, and Kalima. It requires us to acquire the skill necessary. So whatever your spiritual practice is, if it's a meditator, meditate. That's the only way that you're going to acquire skill in meditation is if you actually do it. You can read a book, and you may have a logical understanding of it, but that will not do anything, really. It'd be a drop in the bucket, period. You have to take action. You need to sit with it, and you need to sit with it long enough that you start to boil, you know? You don't just eat pasta out of the box. You put it in the water, you boil it, and you boil it until it gets to the point where you like it, you know, where it's, it's cooked and it's ready for nourishing. Well, meditation is the same way. You have to sit with it until you start kind of boiling, until you've been cooked. And then you are ripe for the nourishing then you are ripe for the nourishing. Prior to that, you're raw. And raw is much more difficult to digest than that which has been slightly cooked. So if your practice is meditation, then be a meditator. Dedicate yourself to that for a good amount of time every single day over a long period of time with little to no interruption and great enthusiasm. If you practice yoga asana, and that's your primary practice, then get on your yoga mat twice a day, every day, and practice your yoga asana. Become skillful through education. If you are a scholarly yogi, which is called a jnani yogi, someone who studies the scriptures, then study the scriptures every day. You wake up, you go to the bathroom, come back to your bed, sit there and read for 20 minutes to half an hour and read the same thing several times so that it becomes second nature to you and it begins to fill the thoughts of the mind instead of the other stuff filling the thoughts of the mind. Whatever your spiritual practice is, if it's service, then get out into the world and start serving. Let go of the excuses. This world is not going to heal itself. And then she will. If we want to be part of it, we have a responsibility to step up and into the service. If we don't mind being obliterated and becoming an extinct species ourselves, then we could just hang out in the tamasic place and not do anything. It's fine. But the reality is, is that we're just going to get wiped over like every other species gets wiped over eventually. Unless we interactively take part in her creation, maintenance, and destruction then maybe we have a chance of being here for a little longer and not becoming extinct ourselves. Whatever your spiritual practice is, dive into that spiritual practice 100%. Be all in, not at all out. Be all in. All in to the inquiry, all in to the potential, all in to, to the practice of it, all in to the learning, all in. Let it, let it touch every part of your life. There is not a part of your life it can't touch. Oh, well, my husband's not into it. So what? That doesn't stop you from being a yogi or a spiritualist. You know? Oh, my friends think I'm crazy. So what? It doesn't matter. They're going to think you're crazy if you go to the bar and get drunk, too, and start, you know, acting that way, right? So you're crazy if you do. You're crazy if you don't. So what does it matter what they think? It doesn't matter what they think. What matters is how your heart feels. And, and can, you, can you find contentment in yourself? You know? Somebody one time said to me, well, not just one time, many times, they say, why do you say to everybody, much love and blessings? Like, you know, why do you say that to people? You don't even know. It's because I mean it. Because I want them to know they're loved. And that there's blessings abundant for them. What would I say? Well, maybe just goodbye. Like, no. Yeah. That doesn't feel right to me. It doesn't feel right to just say, bye. <laughs> 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 
didn't feel right, did it? <laughs> yeah. And I don't know that, that sometimes they understand, sometimes they get it, and other times they don't. But it's a matter of paying attention to what feels right to you and coming from that place of intention. So if I want to tell everybody in the world so much love to you and so many blessings, I'm going to. Not only because it brings peace to them on some level, but it brings peace to me too. It allows me to exist more consistently in a state of equanimity than turmoiling over, well, should I just say goodbye? Was that too cold? Was that too impersonal? What do they think? You know, it's like, I don't have time for that. That's just mental hogwash. I don't have time for that. We're only here for anywhere from however many years till however many years. That's not a long time. It's not like we have thousands of years in this particular body. And when we come back in the next one, we won't have too much of a memory of this one. So sadly, we'll forget most of what we learned. Maybe. <clears throat> Who really knows? Sometimes we remember, I guess. Or we have an inkling, like a deja vu. Like, hmm, I feel like I've known this before. Yeah. And then do we listen to that? Or do we just go, that was cool. And we, we didn't grasp what it was that we were remembering, you know. But the more you have yourself embedded into your spiritual practice, the more when that type of a situation happens where deja vu comes to you. And for those of you who aren't familiar with deja vu, it's the, it's the feeling that you've been someplace or done something before. You already know it. You already know it. And yet you have no recollection at all of ever being there. The more embedded we are in our spiritual practice, the easier it becomes to recognize that kind of an experience for exactly what it is. Oh, I'm supposed to remember this. Okay, I'll pay attention. Thank you. Not, that was cool. What's next? That's why when they say in meditation, when you see colors and you see flowers and eyes and symbols, you don't become too engrossed in those. They're there to remind you of something. Be reminded of that. And then go there. Be with whatever it is that it's reminding you of. Your sacred self, your inner self, your, your inherent goodness, the vastness of the universe, you know. So these three, Rajasattva and Tamas, they are aspects of the goddess, and they are constantly friction with one another, playing with one another. And that comes through our life experience. Everything we experience in this life is the interaction of these three qualities. And then we have this really amazing, beautiful thing called free will. So we walk through this world, which is the expression of the God and the goddess, the play of the God and the goddess, um, completely out of our control. We can't control any of this, even if we think we can. We can manipulate it a little bit, but in the end, you know. But the one thing we do have is free will. And free will dictates what I'm going to do, no matter what comes to me. So it starts raining. I wake up a little lazy. Say, oh, today's a good day. Pull the covers over the head. Just stay here feel that tamasic nature taking over. So make a choice. Well, you know what? It's a rainy morning. It's a good morning to sit rather than lie down. So I'm going to get myself up, make the choice to meet this day right where it is, get onto my meditation cushion and take this opportunity. The goddess brought this weather to me, not so I could fall into that place of Hamas, but so that I could sit in the space of self-realization. Nice, bright, sunny day comes along. The sun is out. It's energetic. And you're like, oh, I'm going to go surfing and boating and down to the amusement park. And I'm gonna go, go, go. Very Tamas. I mean, Rajas. Very Rajasic. Very um, active. Well, the goddess brought you that sunny day. So... 
I'm going to start my day with this wonderful energy that she's giving me. I'm going to get on my yoga mat and I'm going to practice twice as long as I usually do. And then when I'm done, if I still wish to go somewhere, I'll go mindfully. So whatever it is that comes to us, comes to us for our betterment, not for our detriment. A storm comes and cleans your house out. Yes, there's attachment there. And it's very sad when we lose the things that we, that we care about. But if you look at the entirety of the picture, you're being cleared out for reasons beyond understanding right now. But that will become obvious when the time is right. And it is the same thing with people. People moving in and out of your life, whether it's because they're moving away or relationships ending or people dying, people being born, they have their work to do on their path. They're not here to entertain us. You're not here to entertain others. The honoring of another human being is to say, you've arrived, welcome. You're departing. So much love and so many blessings. It's been my honor. No matter what that person brought to you. It's so important. Yes, grief. I'm no stranger to grief. I miss my husband every day. Every day. But I also recognize that this portion of his journey was complete. And I'm just so grateful that he spent it with me. And that we had that time together. And we were able to experience together what we experienced together. And because I understand that, it makes it not easier, but it makes it more understandable. Just more understandable. That if he were here now, it would be like trying to sprout that seed before it's time. It's not what was meant to be. Yeah. But we're constantly in our mind and in our emotions tossed around by these gunas, as they're called, rajas, sattva, and tamas. We're thrown around by them, and we think we're helpless. We think we're hopeless. We think we have no control over ourself because we have no control over what's outside of us. But yoga teaches us the exact opposite. And so do most traditions. If you really read what most traditions teach or listen to, to well-done interpretations, commentaries, you have exactly what you need. Exactly what you need. Because that's your proving ground. That's your proving ground. You know, you go, you go for a job interview, right? You want to be the, uh, the director of an organization. What do you have to do to get that position? You have to attend an interview. And whoever it is that's interviewing you is assessing your readiness, correct? They're assessing your readiness for this position. And if you have the skill and the personality, maybe you'll get it. Your spiritual path is not much different, except that the person who's interviewing you is yourself, your higher self. And you've stepped up and said, I'd like to be interviewed for enlightenment, please. <laughs> I'd like to be interviewed for the position of awakening. <laughs> and your higher self says, have you sat and meditated? Have you gotten on your mat for twice as long as you usually do? Have you accepted the storm and the sunshine? Or are you still tossed about like a hopeless individual, not knowing your own strength, your own resiliency, your own sacredness, your own power? And if the answer is no, you haven't acquired the skills yet, then your inner self says, continue trying. Step it up. And this is where Dorgama, Kalima come in and they say, step it up. 
And as Laura said, for the retreat attendees who were here Friday night, she would go over here for shiny thing and the goddess is like, go this way. <laughs> and sometimes it's a rather abrupt turning, you know? And she's like, but I want to go over there. And the goddess is like, no, go this way. Similarly, the rain will keep coming and it will keep downpouring onto every dream and every intention until you accept it. And then it will continue downpouring. But your relationship to it will be different and you'll see the beauty and the sacredness in it instead of the, the treachery and the horribleness. Horrible is something that's human. There's no such thing as horrible. It's a human construct. Actually, everything is a human construct. If we're really gonna be honest about it, love is a human construct, hate is a human construct, treachery is a human construct. We categorize everything so that we can figure out how to live in this world which is beyond our understanding. So we try to put it into human terms and we made up those terms to describe and define a very tiny little part of a very, very big picture. It's like looking at one star in the sky and saying, that is the sky. We look at one little thing and we say, that is life. Life is treachery. Life is fear. Life is dissatisfaction. Life is love. Life is this. Life is that. But if we really want to know what life is, we have to just look at life. And maybe on some level, put away the less useful descriptions. And focus on, because we're human, we have to focus on something. Until we don't. Focus on that which brings you closer to balance. That which brings you closer to equanimity. And that which takes you further from harm and violence. Because harm and violence keep us in a state of hating change. Resisting change. Grasping at everything. Violence is really, you know. You know, the difference between the storm and the human is that the human means it. Right? Like, people don't act violently unless that's what they intend to do. You know, they see somebody, they're like, I'm going to hurt you. And so they do. And, and then it becomes really complicated because that same person may be walking around saying, I love everybody. I love everybody. I'm going to hurt that person. It's very manipulative. And it's very much on purpose. Targeting. Right? The storm that's out there right now, what is it targeting? Nothing. Nothing. It just is. It means no harm to anyone. It's just expressing itself. There's no anger there. There's no such thing as an angry storm. There's only angry people <laughs> looking at a storm and, and symbolically recognizing something in themselves. <coughs> the storm is there to clean the earth, to clean the waterways, to nourish the ground, to bring water to the plants. The storm is there to interact in a very symbiotic way. And if you go out and stand in that storm, not if there's lightning, unless you do, but if you go out and stand in that storm, you'll be nourished too. You'll be nourished too. That rainwater will come down and it will nourish the cells of your body. You ever go out in the rainstorm and come in and your hair is so soft, your skin is so soft, and you feel so vibrant? But here's what happens. You think, you know, I remember when I was a kid and I used to go out and I'd just stand in the rainstorm and, and it felt so good. Oh, but I can't go now, I'll get all wet. It's like, <laughs> the human mind is just so ridiculous sometimes. It's like, go get wet. I was doing a talk one time at the uh, Lakehurst base, and I was working with military families with uh, partners who were coming back from being deployed. And so they were having this huge presentation of awards, and they asked me to speak. And we're in this huge, you know, space, which is mostly metal, and it starts pouring. And you can hear that. Boom, 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 boom. And, 
and it's coming toward the end of this event, and everybody's getting ready to leave. And you can feel the tension in the room mounting as people are getting ready to stand in line by the door <laughs> and run <coughs> as fast as they can to their car. I, wasn't, I was not different. I was there with a student of mine named Amanda, and we're in line, you know, and it's like thunder. And it's just absolutely stunning, stunning storm. Had I been anyplace else, you know, I just would have sat and watched it. But here I am, part of this kind of, you know, mob mentality. And Amanda's like, okay, you ready? We're going to run. We get to the door, and the guy opens the door, and we step outside, and Amanda runs. And I just stopped. Uh. (laughs) And she turns around, she's like, come on. I'm like, you're wet anyway. (laughs) Just stop and enjoy it. And so we walked very slowly across the parking lot, got absolutely saturated, but it was beautiful, you know? because we were going to get wet anyway. You can't dodge the raindrops. It's just not possible. But we try to dodge the raindrops. And so the goddess sends us some more. She sends us what we need, and as much of it as we need, until we come into the skill of knowing that we can't dodge the raindrops. And we can't dodge the coming and the going. And we can't dodge the change. The only thing, (coughs) excuse me, the only thing that we can do is have a degree of control over our reactions and our responses so that our responses are more in line with recognition of the sacred, recognition of the higher self, recognition of the existence of sorrow, suffering, recognition of the potential of healing, and the intention to support that healing rather than supporting the suffering. So your free will is important. It's so important. And the things that come to us in life that, that we think, well, I, I could be all of that if those people would just leave me alone. Those people are raindrops. You're not going to get away from them. So stop trying to. And instead, stand on your own two feet as the person that you are. And don't let them sway your intention, who you know yourself to be. And don't don't give in to them either, either. Because you don't have to. We justify entirely too much, you know? Someone comes along and they say, why'd you dye your hair? Oh, well, and when I was 13, and we go through this justification. Why do you wear white? Like, it's simple. You know, that's my new answer. It's simple. It's simple. And they're like, oh. And then they walk away perplexed. (laughs) The mailman, you know, delivers your mail, and he has something he has to hand to you to get a signature. And we're so compelled to apologize and then to justify the apology. Like, it's the silliest little things. Every single thing that comes our way, we feel like we have to justify, apologize. And the reality is we don't. You don't have to justify who you are. And you don't have to apologize for who you are. The mailman is meant to deliver your mail. He's meant to walk up those stairs and ask you for a signature. That's what he is meant to do. You don't have to apologize to him for it. The person at the grocery store is meant to bag your groceries. That's what they're there to do. Let them do their job. And instead of saying, I'm sorry, or feeling bad for them, say, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful for you. Thank you so much. You have no idea how much your presence in this moment supports my day. I hope that I'm supporting yours as well. Isn't that better than justifying? When we come into this place of gratitude, when we come into this place of recognition of the sacred, recognizing the mother, 
recognizing the Father, just recognizing all of it. We come to a place where we begin to know ourselves. And that's a pretty cool person to know. And the more that we know ourselves, the easier it becomes to continue the inquiry. Then suddenly we want to get on the yoga mat more often, or in the Tai Chi class, or in the meditation cushion, whatever it happens to be. Suddenly we really want to. You know, it's like, oh, this is so neat. I get to meet myself again. Wonder what I'm like today. Wonder what part of the onion is going to peel itself back. And suddenly, you know, you're called to cry about something. You know, maybe it's a, a, a welling up of grief or sorrow of some sort. And suddenly you're just like, okay, go ahead. Do what you need to do. Instead of kicking yourself. Oh, I'm crying, I must be weak. It's like, no, I'm crying, I'm expressing. Those tears are the same as the raindrops. And they're all part of the goddess, every one of them. Denying any part of yourself is denying the goddess and the god. Denying any part of anyone else is denying it, denying the goddess and the god. Denying any part of the world is denying that. Because in the yoga teachings, everything, everything is that. Not just the light, but also the shadow. Not just the day, but also the night. Not just the good part of you, but also the part you don't like. Not just the butterfly, but also the bee. Not just the, you know, the, the beautiful horses and llamas and cats and dogs, but also the spider, the creepy crawlies. Right? They're also, there's nothing that isn't her. The earthquake is her, the rainstorm is her, the sunshine is her, the calm sea is her. It's all her. And the more that we can walk through this world with recognition of her, the more beautifully powerful and happy our life will be. So acknowledge that the gunas are there, this rajas, this sattva, and this tamas, but that they are part of her. And that our psychology as an embodied human being causes us at times to really not like that and, and to retaliate against it or to try to cause it to be another way or to just condemn it. And utilize your free will so that you can change that pattern of behavior towards something that is more inclusive, towards something that is more full of recognition rather than avoidance. Allow yourself to grow and prosper in your spiritual path and in your spiritual practice. And a lot of times students ask, what is a spiritual practice? Well, since this weekend is focused on the goddesses, we'll stay with the goddesses. The goddesses tell you what your spiritual path is. They not only tell you the qualities that, that they represent, that are present in the world and in you. But they tell you that the cultivation of those qualities is your spiritual path, clarity. Whatever you need to do to become a clearer person, that's your spiritual path. Courage. Whatever you need to do to become a more courageous person, that's your spiritual path, is to cultivate courageousness. Peace. Cultivating peace is your spiritual path. And everything outside of that is a tool. So the yoga asana is a tool. Meditation, you know, sitting in concentration is a tool. It's also, you know, the, it's also the name of what the outcome is. But the sitting down on a cushion, that's a tool. It's like going to school, opening up a book, and reading to learn your history. You sit on your meditation cushion so that you can open up your heart and learn who you really are. So they're telling you what the path is, what the quality is that you are pursuing, and what the outcome is. So the quality you are pursuing is clarity. You're going to pursue that quality by undertaking techniques that improve your clarity. And at the outcome, you're going to be clear. Compassion? Well, your path is compassion. And 
your path is going to be filled with techniques that cultivate compassion. And in the end, what are you going to get for it? You're going to become compassionate. That is your spiritual path. We don't need to look further than that. We really don't. We don't need to say, well, you know, we don't need to reach for goals that are far, far, far outside of our understanding and our cognitive ability. And in some instances, this conversation about oneness in the spiritual community today is a very lofty conversation that not a lot of people understand, which makes it on some levels a little bit of a detrimental slippery slope. Because who in here has ever heard someone use the word oneness? And be like, oh, I'm all for oneness. Yeah? Okay, I'm going to have your most bitter enemy sit right next to you. Yeah? Still for oneness? Going to have that spider bite your toe. Still for oneness? And have the bumblebee sting you. Still for oneness? Hmm. You know, Swami Shivananda... He was born in 1800s. And I think he died in 1963, if I'm not mistaken. Or maybe it was before that, I don't know. But anyway. So he was a great saint, a living saint. And there's a story about him that he was sitting there one day, you know, satsang with his, his students, and a mosquito landed on his arm. And one of his students got up and went to swat the mosquito away. Now, you know, they're in India. It's malaria, right? Yeah. Dengue and all those other things. And he said, leave it her alone. She's feeding her babies. Leave her be. She's not hurting me. And the devotee was like, Swamiji, it's dangerous. It's only dangerous if you believe in the danger. And you let her eat. And then she flew away. <laughs> How many of you would do that? Yeah. I think it's easier for mothers to kind of get that. You know, I think it's easier for someone who cares for others to kind of get that the sacrifice needs to be made. But oneness means, on some level, maybe beginner level, that we look at everything as the same, as one. Like we look up at the sky... And the night sky is not just the star. It's the entirety of the sky. And there's nothing out there, whether it's seen by the eye or not, that isn't part of that sky. So when we say everything is one, what we're saying is everything in this universe and beyond is part of that one, whether my eye can see it or not. And there's nothing that's excluded. It doesn't mean you have to throw your arms around people and be like, I love you, man. Yeah. You don't have to do that. But, you, but if you're practicing oneness, you can't exclude them either. So you need to have a tactful way of negotiating your emotions, your feelings, honoring yourself, and also honoring them for the potential that they carry to discover their inherent goodness, the same as you're working in your life to discover yours. And a spiritual practice makes that so much easier. So much easier. A consistent spiritual practice over a long period of time, little to no interruption, and great enthusiasm. If that's the way that your spiritual practice is practiced, then your spiritual practice becomes parasadana. It becomes a supreme practice. And it becomes a supreme practice that opens us up to the truth of who we really are. And the truth of who we really are doesn't mind the rain at all. And it doesn't mind the coming and going. Because it understands that, that this is just a coat. It's a coat, like your winter coat or your spring coat. It's just a jacket. And that the soul or the spirit that is within is eternal, is going to come back here over and over and over again, wearing different jackets making a fashion statement, or not. And then, at some point in time, once we have embraced the beauty and the awesomeness, the completeness, the entirety 
Saraswati, Lakshmi, Dorgama, Kalima, of all of the forms of the goddess and all that they have to teach us, then maybe we won't have to come back anymore. If we do come back at that point, maybe we'll come back as a saint in service of others, in service of the alleviation of suffering. But in order to do that, in order to, and there are people who have such a lofty goal in their spiritual path. It's not just about having a heyday in this time, you know. It's about how am I going to come back again? If you adhere to reincarnation, you do have a concern about how you return. And so how you return is in part dictated by how you live in this life. So suddenly this life, it becomes kind of important to pay attention on purpose. It becomes important to cultivate these relationships, to listen when the goddess says, you need to acquire skill. You need to study. You need to speak the truth. You need to recognize abundance everywhere. Recognize that there is a phase called maintenance, just like there is a phase called birth or creation, and there is a phase called death or destruction. And be moved less by those phases, understanding that this is all only temporary, no matter how much you wish it to be different. She's also telling us we need to acquire clarity, courage, straightforwardness, and that we need to sway less. We need to yield, but we need to sway less in our intention. If you have an intention, all these qualities that the Divine Mother teaches us teach us how to stand into our intention fully according to our own principles and our own understanding, which is typically, for most of us, grounded in a scripture, a teaching of some sort. And so it's important that we don't abandon that. If you're Catholic, read the Bible. If you're a Muslim, read the Quran. If you're Baha'i, read the certitudes. If you're not, read all those and more. If you're a Hindu or a yogi, read the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, the Upanishads. And if you're not a yogi or a Hindu, read them anyway. The more that you read the scriptures, the more you'll get a picture of your potential. Because that's what every scripture tells you. It's not just a bunch of really great stories put together to amuse us. That's what people say. They call them parables and they say, oh, this story is so great, but I could never do that. No, the, the scriptures, no matter what tradition they are, they're meant to be read as if that were you. That's you in that story. Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita is you. Krishna is your potential. Arjuna is who you are now. And for those not clear on that, Arjuna was a warrior, and he had the dilemma of having to carry out a war where one side was his brothers and close friends, his wife, and a small, small group of people, and the other side were his cousins, teachers, people he grew up with, all the town folk, his uncle, but the leadership on that side, which stole the kingdom, were very crooked. And Arjuna's responsibility, dharmically, was to stand up and to stand for righteousness. And he didn't want to, because he knew them. He knew all those people, and he loved them. And he didn't want the responsibility of having to do this, because he was afraid of the outcome. And so he said to Krishna, who, you know, in the Bhagavad Gita and in many lineages within uh, Hinduism, is the Godhead, is the masculine aspect of God. Krishna said to him, explained the yoga, explained suffering, explained healing, explained dharma, explained the four paths of yoga. He told him who he was. And he pointed out who Arjuna believed himself to be incorrectly. He said, you think this is you, and you are incorrect in that assumption. This is who you really are. And he, he spends 18 chapters mm -hmm. explaining to him who Arjuna really is. Hopefully that made sense. So the scriptures that we read are not just there for entertainment, 
they actually paint a picture of our potential. And they paint a picture of the path that we should follow in order to reach that potential. And when we talk about the goddess, and when we talk about the god, and when we talk about yoga, and we talk about chakras, we're not just talking about like exotic ideas from some faraway land called India. <laughs> Go in there again. <laughs> what we're talking about is a mirror. And on one side of the mirror is the mistaken identity that we have acquired in this life. And on the other side of that mirror is who we really are. And every scripture is the path to bring us there. All we have to do is read it in that light. And the goddess tells us, you must acquire skill. Whatever supports your acquiring skill is the path to follow. And skill will be the outcome. Recognition of the abundance and the potential. Whatever you do, recognize. Acknowledge abundance. Acknowledge the sacred. Acknowledge the potential. And by doing so, the outcome will be recognition. Clarity. Discernment. Practice discernment every day. Every moment that you can think of it. Practice discernment. Practice straightforwardness. Compassionate truth. That's your path. And what you'll receive is clarity. So they're very, it's, it's really simple. It's really simple. You get to know the goddess by following her direction and by embodying her quality and by acknowledging that that's where it came from. By being humble, clear, strong, discerning, compassionate, faithful, skillful, and creative. And once we cultivate that relationship with each of these aspects of the one, or just with the one, then suddenly that rainstorm is no issue. Not an issue. There's poor people in the street who, who don't have food. Not an issue. Ah, what do you mean that's not an issue? Because I know what to do. Feed them. Period. There's hungry people, feed them. There's people who need medical care, help them get medical care. There's a child crying, find out why. Suddenly, you know what to do. So it's no longer an issue. The issue is this. You see a homeless person? Well, my heart is saying go give him a dollar, but I know he's just going to go use it on alcohol. So maybe I'll walk by and be snarky with him instead. That's not in line with the goddess. He doesn't have food? Feed him. He doesn't have shelter? Ask him if he wants it. And if he doesn't want shelter, then leave him alone. Just because you want shelter doesn't mean he wants shelter or she wants shelter. They're different than you are. Come into a deep honoring of others and what they truly want in this life and what they think they want in this life. It doesn't mean that you have to live without shelter. If you want shelter, you find shelter. If they don't want shelter, then don't judge them for that. That would be the same as you know, everybody on your block wears dark purple and you wear hot pink. You want to have the freedom to wear hot pink, don't you? Mm -hmm. Well, then why don't you give him the freedom of not having shelter if that's what he says he wants? It's the same thing. It really is. And the more that we cultivate the relationship with the goddess, the more we cultivate the relationship with the divine, the more we understand that. And then the easier life becomes because we just meet each other where we're at. And there's less judgment, less hate, less violence. And a, a greater degree of appreciation and gratitude. 
So I'll open it up to questions or reflections. Thoughts, ideas, answers. <laughs> Anybody? Davey, would you like to say anything? <laughs> Beloved Davy was up chanting to Kalima all night long. All night long. Yeah. So if you're feeling a beautiful energy in the building today, it's all that chanting and Kali's presence here with us, helping us diminish the ignorance. Beautiful thing. Yeah. So no questions or reflections. We're good? <laughs> All right, let me see what time it is here. Oh, perfect. Oh, my gosh. It's actually 11.30. Ah, very good. <laughs> I'm slightly impressed. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's sit nice and tall and close the eyes. Beloved Mother, in all your forms and all your wonder, come to us, uplift us, open us up, empty us out, and then refill us with your grace, your wisdom, with the qualities of your being. Allow us to bow down at your feet, humble and receptive of your blessings. Empower us to love one another, truly love one another as you love us. Empower us to nourish, nourish each other <clears throat> as you nourish us. Empower us to live in peace. Empower us to be peaceful. Join the hands together in front of the heart, and together we'll lift our voices in one ohm. Take a nice breath in. Oh. I'm bowing the head toward the heart, acknowledging all that is. Enjoying the face to center. Thank you so much for being here today. So good to see and gather with each one of you. Enjoy your day. And if you haven't had pancakes yet, you really should. Because they're, <laughs> they're so totally good. Yeah. And um, just as a reminder, Dayananda will actually lead the Wisdom Circle next week. So please do come and, and allow him to serve you by sharing with you. He's got some beautiful insights. And he'll also be teaching the yin practice next Sunday. And then I'll be back the week after that. So enjoy your day. And I'll see you all very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Oh, wow.